we interviewed two individuals on their accounts of their educational experience. Taylor interviewed her nan who attended Manifold Heights Primary beginning in 1950, and in 1956 she began her high school at Geelong High. Ryan interviewed his dad who attended Neil College from 1975 to 1987. Both accounts were quite interesting to hear about. They presented some significant similarities and differences between one another and also between today's education and schooling. In order to find the required information, we came up with some questions to ask the interviewees. Taylor and Ryan then set out to interview the two individuals. We then discussed the answers and findings as a group and linked some of the main discussion areas with literature and policies that relate to education today. So in the 1950s, Nan described her schooling structure of having only one teacher in charge of one classroom. There was no team teaching like there is now. Students sat in desks of two, boys and girls didn't sit next to each other, and there were no computers in the school. So a tech man would come in with his own gear once a week to show a film on nature through a projector. Health in Manifold Heights was taken by the classroom teacher as there was no professional to come in. Health was more about hygiene and general health. Reproduction wasn't discussed and there was no school nurse around to explain anything further in depth. There was a school inspector who would come around and watch the teachers and mark them on how well they stuck to the curriculum. And with this mark, teachers could apply for a promotion. Next, I asked Nan which students went on to higher education, and her response was, only those that were smart enough got into, got into academic high schools, or the tech schools. There was a direct passage from primary to high school, and all kids went on to grade 7 and 8, and then would go out into the workplace. The discipline in the 1950s was very different to what it is now. Nan said it was usually only the female teachers who would make you stand outside the classroom door. For girls... They would be made to write out the lines of whatever they had gotten in trouble for. Punishment for mostly girls, but boys as well, would also to be sit next to the opposite sex in the class. There would be a designated male teacher, or sometimes even the principal, who would use a leather belt and students would be whipped across the palm. There were some teachers who would whack students on the knuckles with a wooden meter ruler. With gender, the students were made to do practical subjects. The boys had to do woodwork and better work, and the girls had to do knitting and sewing. The male teachers would take the boys and the female teachers would take the girls and it was all very separated. The girls all sat over on one side of the classroom and the boys were seated on the other side of the room. During this time, everyone was dealing with post-war struggles and so everyone was in the same boat with the financial struggles. Everyone was from a working class family. Nan said there would only be one or two students that had come from a well-to-do family. There were no Indigenous students at the school. In culture, there was not a lot of diversity among the, among the school in the 1950s. 95% of the students were Australian, and there were not a lot of people that had travelled overseas. Nan had only two Swedish students in her whole school experience. Religion in Nan's school wasn't a compulsory thing. There was always a Monday morning prayer. The students would say the national anthem, God Save the Queen, and a video. During Christian education, the teachers would go out of the room, and a Christian local would, would come in and teach religion as a volunteer. The political views were very strict and were enforced with no questions. There was never any discussion. What the government said, society did obediently. It was the same in schools. If the teacher said, come here, you would. If the teacher said, stand up and sit over there, you would. Teachers had the authority and students behaved accordingly. If you had, sorry, you had to obey instruction. It was very authoritative. There was no room for having your mind, a mind of your own. Society was torn between freedom and security. The government would tell you to do something and the police would tell you to do something. Society was always being told what to do and there were consequences if you stepped out of line. Then life did that way because she knew what she had to do. She knew what she couldn't do and so she knew not to cross boundaries and felt guarded and secure. It was different for her husband. Pop felt restricted and not free. He felt like he was unable to think and decide for himself. There was no such thing as political correctness back then. Racial abuse wasn't an issue as they, as they knew as they would do the same thing back. The racial abuse never got out of hand. Both cultures knew it was just name calling. It wasn't a derogatory remark to call someone a wolf back then. People could say what they wanted, and it was unusual to hear of kids from broken homes. Married couples stayed together no matter what they went through, and divorce was incredibly rare. People stuck together. The political views on education at the time were the government wanted everyone to be educated. Truancy wasn't ex accepted, and authorities frowned on truancy. 
Education was what got you up the social ladder, and it was the ladder to success. Parents wanted their kids to learn. Education was the most important thing. And unless kids got a job before year 10, they would stay at school. Mm -hmm. Nan's key experiences during their time in school was her strong belief in Christianity and believe that many of her experiences was God telling her and guiding her through her decisions in education. Once an inspector asked her if she enjoyed reading, and then answered with Christian books. She later found out that he was a Christian, and that that was the way Nan got into teachers college, where she learnt the ropes of becoming a teacher. Nan's own views on education was that education nowadays is fantastic. Her nephew James taught in a teen teaching environment and Nan loved how that gives students the opportunity to succeed and develop their abilities at their own levels. She likes how they have, put, have an input into their learning and as well with the parents to help out around the classroom. Nan loves the opportunity disadvantaged children have to learn as her grandson has a learning disability. He is able to learn at his level and still gather knowledge. Nan likes the way, that Nan likes the way teachers give up so much time and go out of their ways to help students, whereas back in her day, they would only give up extra lunch times. <clears throat> Alright, so the structure of schooling for Dad was much different to how it is today. Classrooms were set out with desks in rows of seven or eight. The teacher's desk was at the front of the classroom and it was raised on a kind of stage. Blackboards covered the walls behind the teacher's desk. From primary school up until about year seven, the year level consisted of around 60 students. From year 7 to 11, the year level began declining in size as students were leaving school to pursue full-time work. By year 12, there were only about 15 students left. Out of those 15 students completing year 12, around 10 of them went on to higher education at university. Discipline. Up until about year 7 or 8, students who misbehaved would get the strap across the back of their hands or on their backside. Dad said there was one teacher who used a metal ruler to practice cricket shots against their behind. Writing lines was another form of punishment, as well as staying in after school, getting yelled at, and doing yard duty and picking up rubbish. <coughs> there were kids that got suspended from school back then, but Dad doesn't recall anyone actually getting expelled. Gender. Boys and girls were required to line up separately, but gender equality was in the early stages. When Dad's siblings went to school, the girls did home echo and sewing, while the boys did woodwork and metalwork. However, when Dad was in school, some ten years later, the boys and girls both did sewing, home echo, woodwork, and metalwork. Social class. As the school that Dad went to was quite small, there wasn't really a presence of social class separating students. There were the poor kids and the rich kids, however, they all mingled together and got along. Culture. The cultural diversity at the time was very little, as it was very much a white Anglo Saxon school. There were, however, some students who were considered international, but there was only about one child per year level. Dad said that they were never excluded, but were just seen as another student. The political presence in the community at the time was very little, as the seat in which the school was located was and still is the safest seat in Australia. But it's very conservative, as it belongs to the Liberal National Party. The community doesn't really have a voice, as the seat isn't in any danger of being challenged. Political views towards education. The politi political views and education at the time were not really relevant. The community was too small to influence change. If the teachers had an issue with how the curriculum was being run, they would have very little chance of being heard. Some significant experiences Dad reflected upon was the abolishment of the strap. Uh, and he remembers a certain teacher who wrote his own curricul curriculum for geography, which didn't include much geography at all. This particular teacher challenged the political views at the time, taught them about the environment, he taught them about politics outside the traditional liberal national views, and also taught them about religion and challenge ideas from religion. Uh, Dad's own views on education. Looking back, Dad is able to see that there's much more variety of subjects being taught today. One thing he noticed was that bullying back then was just a part of schooling. Both teachers and students did it. It wasn't a bad thing back then. Dad, however, still thinks that the overall system and structure of school back then wasn't too bad. Some significant areas that stood out for us when hearing from both of our interviewees were discipline, gender and social class. Discipline in schools has significantly changed over the past few de decades. Both of our interviewees were educated in the time when corporal punishment was one of the main forms of discipline. This form of punishment of course is now banned due to the policies and requirements for schools. Corporal punishment was banned in government schools in 1985 and not banned in non-government schools until 2006. 
The Education and Training Reform Act 2006 states in section 2.4.6 that the Secretary after investigation may take action under this part against an employee who contravenes a requirement by or under any act of corporal punishment not administered to any government school student. This statement concludes that any teacher who chooses to use corporal punishment will be investigated and more likely to be terminated. Barryfield suggests that Australians somewhat overreact to misbehaviours that we as teachers need to see as problems that we as teachers need to see problems in schools as challenges rather than crises. Behaviours that have been punished, at, such as distractions and interruptions, do not compare to the violence and unrest experiences in other countries like the United States. Schools today are required to have a student engagement policy which addresses in, engaging students as well as discipline and behaviour. Each school's student engagement policy must ensure that disciplinary measures are consistent across the whole school and also that they are proportionate to the behaviour displayed. The policy must also ensure that there is opportunities for teachers and other school staff to identify and address the causes of the behaviour and therefore attempt to prevent such behaviours again in the future. Both of our interviewees explain that writing lines was another form of punishment used while they attended schools. This is not as popular in schools anymore, however, punishments that are regularly used in schools today involve withdrawal of privileges, detention, suspension and or expulsion. With the extraordinary use of technology in school these days, withdrawal of pri privileges would be one of the most effective punishments as students are often keen to use technology as much as they can. Gender is also another interesting aspect of schooling that has developed over time. Both accounts that we heard from explain that students participating in subjects that suited their gender, for example, physical education for boys and sewing or knitting for girls. Gordon Tate's Making Sense of Mass Education suggests that students are given messages suggesting which subjects are more masculine or, and which are not. He explains that due to such stereotypes, often year 12 students choose subjects based on these messages and then further take these ideas out into their post-schooling life. Even though the stereotypes may be still there, and Tate's argument definitely has some merit, the development in access and participation in subjects regardless of gender over the past few decades is significant. The 1990s report signalled that gender-inclusive practices were being incorporated particularly into math, science and technology curricula. The report concluded that teachers are required to present opportunities for students to experience a wide range of subjects and study areas and must not discriminate based on gender. The mentality prior to the 90s was that students participated in gender type subjects and then went on to work in fields that were also particularly controlled by gender. However, now gender has very little influence over the career path you choose and therefore subject selection or even compulsory subjects are more accessible to both genders. Finally, we discuss social class and culture, what it means and whether it does or has affected schooling and education. Tate states, your social class generally whispers life suggestions to you rather than mellow instructions. He suggests that your social class should not influence or manipulate the level or type of education that you are entitled to and nor receive. Taylor's Nan's experience, Taylor's Nan's experience of social class and culture was post-war and in a time where Australia as a country was recovering from significant hardship and sacrifice. Her school was not overly multicultural, and although the, school, the social class of the students in her school varied, it was not something that was extremely noticeable. Ryan's dad, who went to school 20 odd years after Taylor's nan, was much the same. His school was largely a white Anglo-Saxon school, therefore with very few international students. However, those who were enrolled at the college were not discriminated against. These days there are many children who do not have the benefit of high level education. Goal 1 in the Melbourne Declaration on Educational Goals for Young Australians is that Australian schooling promotes equity and excellence. One of the main ideas for this goal is to ensure that socioeconomic disadvantage ceases to be a significant determinant on educational outcomes. The Melbourne Declaration also aims to promote culture for excellence in all schools by supporting them to provide challenging and stimulating learning experiences. <coughs> <coughs> these need to enable students to explore and build on their gifts and talents. Both of these aspect, aspects should be implemented appropriately which will result in inclusive schools allowing for multicultural schools and educational experiences in Australia.
carpet stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I love, I love